This podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. You should put the lights in there. Yeah. I should just remember which one it is. 40%. Okay. And then the other one, how do I get it back? The, the, the system probably 100% here on this okay. side. Okay. All right. I hope so. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Okay. So, welcome to the afternoon lectures. We will start by the second lecture by Sudhir Sachdev. Uh, yeah, okay, thank you. Um, so, can you hear me? So, mic working? Yeah. So, last time I uh, introduced conformal field theories and showed a few examples in kinetic matter where conformal field theories arise in uh, situations of some experimental interest. Uh, and one example I took was uh, electrons moving on the honeycomb lattice with the Coulomb repul with the repulsion U, and there was a phase diagram between the Dirac semi-metal and the antiferromagnetic insulator, and there was a non-trivial conformal field theory at the quantum critical point between them, uh, which uh, was described by the gross nouveau model, and I talked about some general properties of uh, field theories of that type. Okay, so one of the things I especially focused on uh, at, this, uh, at this special critical point was the current-current correlation function, the two-point current-current correlation function, which I called k mu nu, uh, has this form very generally in any CFT and two plus one dimension. And this constant kappa then is in fact just the conductivity by the Kubo formula that Sean was using this morning. Okay, so today what I want to do uh, is now to take these conformal field theories and add a temperature. So just turn on a temperature and see what happens. Uh, and uh, so there's some general considerations. So in terms of the phase diagram, uh, from general scaling analysis, you could imagine that you get a phase diagram that looks like this. So this is the zero temperature phase transition with the conformal field theory over here. Uh, so that's a scale invariant point. Uh, but as you move away from this point, there's some energy scale that determines the structure of the ground state. So that scale on this side, uh, well, it's easier on that side. It would be the antiferromagnetic moment. Here it's some scale just telling you about the crossover for between the non-trivial fixed point uh, and, and the free Dirac fixed point. So there's some energy scale that vanishes with some power of S as you approach this point. So now when you turn on temperature, there's a second energy scale, which is temperature. So the most simplest thing to do is to compare the energy scale, which vanishes at this point, with temperature. And if temperature is bigger than the energy scale, you're in this uh, orange region. And if temperature is smaller than the energy scale, you're in the blue regions. So the focus of the rest of this, uh, this lecture will be on the orange region, where temperature is the most important perturbation. And you should really think about this, all the physics here, as basically this non-trivial conformal field theory being raised to finite temperature. OK. Now in this case, even this line is a conformal field theory. So you, know, uh, you can go back and forth a bit. But that's the more generic situation. All right, so I, t I went through a little bit about the 1 over NF expansion. Oh, sorry, and the conductivity has these values now at, at higher temperatures. Um, and as I mentioned also, let me just turn this around. Uh, this conductivity is seen in, in experiments on graphene at, uh, at high frequencies. OK, uh, so now let's do the same uh, analysis I did last time, uh, but do it at finite temperature. So in the 1 over NF expansion, the first contribution to the conductivity was just this one fermion loop bubble, so J, J psi bar, that's gamma mu psi. And now you're computing J mu, J nu. And, and that'll be this kind of, uh, this bubble with a gamma mu here and a gamma nu here. Uh, so you, of course, know how to evaluate these graphs. Uh, the only thing that's new at finite temperature uh, is that the integral of a frequency has to be replaced by a sum over frequencies. So instead of doing integral d omega, uh, you just replace that d omega by 2 pi. You replace that by t sum over omega, where omega n are the so-called Matsubara frequencies. It's, well, OK, these are fermions, so uh, it's, what is it? It's pi t times 2n plus 1. OK, so you have to do the sum over omega n rather than uh, the integral over omega. All right, so that's uh, not a completely trivial calculation. If you haven't done it before, 
Uh, it will take you some time to go through it. Uh, you have to do the sum over frequency and then you have to analytically continue. Uh, there are several chapters in many solid state physics books, uh, but I'm not going to go through that here. Uh, I, so, you know, I think the online notes have them, but anyway. So you go through that procedure uh, and analytically continue. And finally, this is the leading order answer at, in the NF goes to infinity limit. Uh, you get this answer. I pulled out the factor of NF. So the first thing you notice is that when omega becomes much bigger than t, it goes to the value, value one quarter. Uh, and that's exactly this value, oops, wrong way, this value over here that you observe in graphene. Uh, but let's look at other lower frequencies. So at lower frequencies, what you see, if I plot this up, uh, it looks like this is a function that goes down to zero. Uh, and then most crucially, uh, there's a delta function at zero frequency whose, whose coefficient is proportional to temperature. Uh, and this is the analog of the Drew de Peak, yes? That's correct. But the green function is originally defined in the, uh, the odd uh, multiple. Yeah, well, that's why it's a tricky calculation. That's correct. But uh, that's absolutely right. So the way you do this is, so, so imagine you know how to do this sum, OK? Yes. And, and then you get uh, a sigma of omega n. So this is only defined in the omega n frequency plane, as you correctly said, at these points. These are the imaginary points. Uh, this is uh, pi t, uh, 3 pi t, and so on, OK? So you evaluate this graph, and you get some numbers. One number here, number here, number here, number here, number here, and so on. You get those numbers. And so what do you do with this? What I want, really, is the conductivity sigma of omega is defined on, on this axis over here, uh, whereas this graph will give you the values at these points. OK, so how do you do the analytic continuation? Well, that's, of course, the bane of our lives uh, in condensed matter physics, how you do this. Uh, and uh, uh, the, formally, the point, the, the way you want to do this is you define sigma of omega n. Uh, you write an, a spectral representation of this. It's d omega over pi times some spectral weight. Uh, let me call it a of omega over uh, omega minus i omega n. So suppose you are able to, you know these numbers, and then you know there's a spectral representation. I'm, I'm now not worrying so much about what happens at infinity. I'm assuming it falls off at infinity. If not, you've got to subtract something here, maybe sigma of infinity. OK. Uh, so there's a spectral representation of this type. So knowing, knowing, knowing sigma of omega n, you've got to determine this. So now there's a theorem in complex variable theory uh, with some mild assumptions on the behavior of sigma of omega as it goes to infinity, that there's given the sigma of omega and there's a unique a of omega. So it's up to you to figure out what that a of omega is. Uh, and once you know a of omega, then sigma of the physical sigma of omega that you're going to measure in a real laboratory will be, uh, will be this thing, uh, a of omega over omega minus omega minus i eta, limit eta goes to 0. So that's the step you have to go through. You know the answer on these points. Uh, from that, you get a of omega. Then you put it in here, and you get sigma of omega. So I assure you, when you do that, you'll get this delta function. Uh, and it's not simple. I mean, you have to go through it. And many people missed it, in fact, in this whole field. Uh, but yeah, it's, ob it's kind of obvious once you think about it correctly that you're going to get it. I'm going to give you a physical picture of what, what it means. Uh, OK. 40% is still on 40%. OK, great. Good question. Please ask more questions like that. <laughs> um, so there's a delta function with a coefficient of order t. And the physical origin is the following. Uh, we are working with a conformal field theory uh, with the chemical potential right at zero. You turn on temperature. Well, when you turn on temperature, you're going to create some thermally excited particles, but you're also going to create an equal number of holes. So you're going to get some particles from here and move them up. So you're going to equal number of particles and holes. 
so these, these uh, and now there's no collision. So you're, there, there's some density of particles and holes. Uh, you put on an electric field. Uh, and uh, the, since they have opposite charges, uh, the relationship in momentum and current is equal and opposite. So, the, so this particle uh, has a velocity, well, has a momentum that's positive k, but its current is in the same direction, whereas this particle as a velocity that's this way. Velocity that's negative, but momentum is positive. And if you work it out correctly, the physical current is moving this way, and the momentum is going, uh, gosh. Yeah, that's correct. The momentum is velocity, well, the momentum. All right, well, I, I'm sorry. I'm not going to get the sign right. But the important point is the particles have momentum and current in the same direction, whereas holes have momentum and current in the opposite direction. Uh, it's a simple consequence of the gamma matrices of, of uh, when you look, down, look at the expression for momentum and current for Dirac fermions. So these particles will, so if you're applying an electric field this way, the currents will add. So there'll be net current uh, of particles and more holes moving in opposite directions. Uh, but the currents will move in the same direction. And it's that current that's freely flowing right now that's going to give you the delta function. Okay, so it's only present at non-zero temperature. All right. So that's, uh, so that's the kind of the, the problem here. So now if you go to next order in 1 over nf, uh, you find that this problem becomes even worse. So if you just naively try to do this at next order in 1 over nf, that would mean including you know, graphs like this or graphs like this, uh, you'll find you'll get derivatives of delta functions and so on. Uh, and, and it becomes even, so the function becomes more and more singular uh, at small frequencies with uh, horrible looking functions. Uh, which gets worse every time you go to higher order perturbation theory. So this is telling you that the 1 over nf expansion is failing, and you really have to resum the 1 over nf expansion. And the way that's done, fortunately, is something that's already been discussed by both Sean and Joe. And that's what the Boltzmann equation does for you. The Boltzmann equation is a way of resumming and broadening this delta function due to collisions between particles. So these, uh, sorry. These particles and holes moving in opposite directions will collide with each other. And when they collide, the current will decay down to zero. Uh, so once you put that in, you'll find that the actual conductivity will look like this in the 1 over nf expansion. Uh, the delta function will broaden out. Uh, and, and the broadening will be proportional to u star squared. Well, this is in some in the interaction matrix element. Between the, between the particles, but U is the coupling between them. In the 1 over NF expansion, this will be of order basically 1 over NF. So the width of this peak will be 1 over NF, and the height of the peak will be of order NF. So, so you can regularize things, uh, but you get a very uh, strange looking function with very strong frequency dependence, which becomes more and more singular the larger the NF, which is the only place you can believe this is out. So that's the heart of the problem. Uh, in applying conventional conformal field theory techniques uh, to a question of this type involving finite temperature transport. Uh, okay. So, but nevertheless, you can learn a few things from this, from this general structure. Uh, what you can say is that we don't, can't fully predict the shape of this frequency dependent conductivity, uh, but it has some width or a Druda like peak, not quite a Druda peak because it's absent at zero temperature. Uh, has a width of order temperature uh, and a height of order unity times uh, this number curly k, which is of order e squared over h. So it's a universal function, but determining the function is not an easy task at all. OK. Uh, so what we'd like is some other method for computing uh, these, uh, uh, the, these frequency dependent conductivities. And that's certainly where, of course, where holography comes in. So the idea, if you remember my previous uh, Last lecture, I said there were two parameters, nf going to infinity and nc going to infinity. Uh, so nf going to infinity, this is what it does. And, and it's not clear how much I can believe this at nf equals 1 or 2. So let, we're going to now try the nc goes to infinity limit, uh, which is basically think about things in a holographic manner. Um, all right. Uh, yeah, let me just skip all of this. This is some general statements about. All right. So that brings me then to introducing holography. Um, and I have, in fact, actually rather detailed notes here uh, that I've prepared on the whole holographic correspondence for condensed matter physicists, of which there aren't too many here, but there are a few. 
On the other hand, um, John went through some of this in his first lecture, uh, and I think Joe did to some extent. So uh, I'm going to go through this uh, just to review everything, but somewhat quickly, but just stop me anytime. Uh, and certainly the notes are much more detailed than what I'm going to say, okay? All right, so what is the ADS CFT correspondence? Well, it's a correspondence between the CFT threes that I want to study uh, and theory of gravity uh, in, in the bulk. And so we start out by just assuming the simplest possible theory of gravity, uh, which is the Einstein action with the cosmolog negative cosmological constant. And it turns out its solution is, in fact, uh, this anti decider uh, metric. Okay. Uh, so now what we want to do is relate various observables of this gravity theory, and we are just going to work with classical gravity, to, to, conform, to the conformal field theory in the boundary. So what I told you about conformal field theory was that each conformal theory, field theory is characterized by a set of primary operators, each with a scaling dimension. Uh, and it's characterized by a certain OPE coefficients, which tell you how you fuse two operators into a third operator. Uh, and knowing this data, uh, there are all kinds of complicated constraints that allow you to figure out any kind of correlation function you want in principle. Uh, and here the perspective I'll take is to show you that just working with gravity and the rules of the ads CFT correspondence, uh, you can at least produce a consistent set of correlation functions for any conformal field theory. Uh, so the first step in this correspondence is, to make, is, this, uh, is this basic, basic rule uh, called the GKW, GKPW ansatz, uh, Gubser, Klevenov, Polyakov, and Witten, uh, between uh, these correlation function of some operator O of X in the CFT, so phi naught is a source uh, of this operator O of X. So once I know this function, I know all the function, correlation function of the CFT in principle, uh, and uh, the, the theory on the bulk. And, and the point, what well, turns out that for every, every operator O of X, there's a, there's a field phi of X that lives in the bulk. Uh, and and the, as R goes to zero, the limit of this field phi uh, as it approaches the boundary is R to the power of D minus delta, where delta is the scaling dimension of O times phi naught of X, which is the source. So this is the basic rule from which you can just construct a huge amount of information. Okay. So for example, if you apply this rule, uh, so now if, if I have some scalar operator O of X, it had this, it's dual to some field phi, and let's assume the field phi in the bulk is just some uh, free field theory. So now you apply this rule, uh, and here's the whole way you go about it. Uh, you solve the, uh, the wave equation in anti de Sitter space, you look at how it behaves in the boundary, you evaluate the left-hand side, and you take the derivative with respect to phi naught. Okay, all the details are here. And all said and done, uh, what you get after a lot of work uh, is this two-point correlation function between the operator O, okay? You want me to go through that more slowly? <laughs> I don't know. It depends on the audience. But so what you reproduce is the expected correlation function of, a, of, two, of a primary operator in a CFT, that it decays uh, with the power 2 delta on them. Okay, so that's... So there's a lot of uh, you know, interesting algebra involved here, solution of differential equation, but the main thing to keep in mind is that from this rule relating uh, correlation function of the CFT to the action of the gravitational theory, uh, you can get uh, the two-point correlation function of any, any operator O, uh, and it turns out to be equal to this, oh, and one very important result, is that delta is related to this m here. So the scaling dimension of the operator delta is related to the mass of the field uh, that I put in over here. So, so in principle, you know, you could say you give me, I give you CFT with a set of operators with a set of scaling dimensions and tell you what they are. And you say, well, okay, I'm just going to write down one field for every one of these operators. Since you gave me the scaling dimension, I know the mass. Uh, and there I'm done. Now I can compute all kinds of correlation functions. Uh, and yeah, we get lots of interesting correlation functions which will, will be quite non-trivial because the, the, the theory in the bulk is not simply a free field theory. It's a complicated theory with, uh, you know, with all these nonlinear terms associated with gravity. So certainly you get very non-trivial correlation functions between your operator and the stress-energy tensor. And all of those are guaranteed 
by the construction and the symmetry of anti sitter space to, be, to obey all the conformal bar identities. And that's really not a trivial thing. It's quite, uh, quite non-trivial that it comes out so simply. OK. So among other operators that, yeah, let me just go on, that I'm interested in are these special operators, uh, the current. So associated with the current, J mu, then there's going to be some field in the bulk. Uh, now it turns out that for, for every conserved current, uh, the, the field in the bulk is a gauge field. And this follows simply from the fact that uh, if the current is conserved in the CFT, uh, then you can see that the, this correlation function is invariant under gauge transformation of uh, A mu. And, and so uh, because of this, you're going to get uh, effective action here that should also be invariant under gauge transformation, very roughly speaking. OK, so for every conserved current, you have a gauge field. And for a conserved U1 current, which is the main thing I'm interested in, uh, you have a U1 gauge field. So you write on the simplest possible action for the U1 gauge field, which is, will have some coupling G. And now the question is, what is the meaning of this coupling G? Uh, so this, this is now living in four dimensions. I'm considering the case of ADS4. And this G is a dimensionless number. So there's a pure number, G sub M which is then associated uh, with every conserved current of the CFT. Uh, what is this number? Well, remember from, from my discussion last time, I told you for every CFT and you have a conserved current, there's a pure number associated with the current. Uh, that's this number right here. Oops. <laughs> uh, this number curly K, right? Uh, the two-point correlation function is curly K, which is related to the conductivity at frequencies much bigger than temperature. Now it turns out that one number for uh, the conductivity is precisely, in fact, the Maxwell constant uh, in, in the holographic theory. OK, yeah, so this coupling constant here turns out to be precisely related to the, the constant curly K in the CFT. Uh, and you can do this by just now applying the usual rules to conserved currents that I have skipped over. All the, these notes are fairly self-contained. I should say they were uh, mainly written by uh, ADS person, so you can believe them. Uh, Suvrat Raju, not by me. <laughs> uh, well, I have, well, we talked a lot, and he ex this is how he explained it all to me. And I put them down. <laughs> uh, and so, sure enough, you compute by the rules uh, J mu, J nu. And you find it's equal to this, this value, as you expected, with k being exactly 1 over gm squared. So the, the Maxwell constant in ADS4 is just the conductivity of the CFT at high frequency, okay. uh, which is the analog of the katz moody level number for CFT2s. OK, so let's keep going. The other special operator we're interested in is the stress energy tensor. So now you're going to put a, a a uh, field that's conjugate to the stress energy tensor, and we're interested in correlation functions of the stress energy tensor. Okay, so it turns out, so, the, so there must be a spin two field here, which is, which is uh, also gauge invariant because the stress energy tensor is conserved, uh, which is conjugate in the bulk to the stress energy tensor. And the only possible spin two field which is gauge invariant is the graviton. So that's how you necessarily have to have a bulk theory with gravitational fluctuations. Uh, and again, there are corresponding rules on the boundary conditions of graviton that allow you to relate correlation function of the stress energy tensor in the CFT to some bulk correlation functions of gravitons. Now, these correlation functions invariably you, you evaluate uh, at tree level. So you can do diagrams in the bulk too, which are called Witten diagrams, but just evaluate them at tree level. You know, I'm never going to include any loops. Uh, so if you do them at tree level, you're just basically doing classical gravity, effectively. So that's what these things mean. These are tree level diagrams. All right, so this is the rule. And now it's just, you take the Einstein action, and you go in and compute the two-point stress energy correlation function. Uh, that actually I'm not going to leave as a homework exercise, because it is quite complicated. It is in the appendix of my paper with Subrat, where He went through it for my benefit. I insisted I wanted. Uh, I wanted to see this thing, and it took him some time too. He said, well, no one's really worked it out, but okay, let me do it. And he did it, and sure enough, what you find is that 
from the gravitational, the Einstein action, if you work out the two-point correlation function, the stress energy tensor, you get exactly the answer, of course, that was expected from conformal invariance. This form uh, one can get from just knowing about conformal invariance of the theory with a, with a pure number out front, C sub T, which is like the central charge. And the central charge turns out to be equal to, to this, uh, this parameter here, which is basically uh, Newton's constant and the ADS radius. So there's some dimensionless combination of kappa squared and L, uh, and that dimensionless ratio is the central charge of the theory. So really what I've shown you now is that I can write down a theory, at least a, a theory in the bulk, which I'm going to treat at three level. Uh, and that theory has many uh, parameters associated with it. Every one of those parameters is in principle determined. Uh, L squared over kappa squared is related to uh, the central charge. The Maxwell constant you know, is related to uh, uh, this curly K. The masses of the field are related to scaling dimensions. Uh, so they're not arbitrary in a sense. There's an overall constant, dimensionful constant, uh, which, is, uh, which eventually becomes important only when you do loop corrections. Uh, that's like a 1 over nc correction, but I'm not going to go that far. All right, so perhaps I'm boring some of you, but hopefully this perspective is useful. Okay, so then how about we try something else? Uh, how about we take a three-point correlation function? You know, well, let's do the OPE, all right? So uh, I've, talked, I've, I've shown you how you can reproduce by this, by this set of rules any two-point correlation function in a CFT. So let's, but we haven't got any OPE coefficients. So let's say I wanted the OPE of two currents, J mu, J nu, uh, of x of zero. So that we've already learned is uh, curly kappa times some delta mu nu, some tensor here, and some power of x to the fourth, I think. Okay, that's the leading term. But then in the OPE, there will be a term like uh, T, mu, T rho sigma, some tensor, which has the indices mu nu rho sigma, and make a gamma mu nu rho sigma, and some power of x, which uh, I suppose I could work out if I was thinking clearly. Uh, it will be 4 minus 2, I think, or something like that, and so on. So this, would be, this gamma is the OPE coefficient. It's a very complicated 4-index tensor which tells you how when you fuse two currents together, you get the stress energy tensor. Okay, so that's a simple example of, a, of an interaction in this theory, rather than just Gaussian two-point correlation functions. All right, so now, so the way to get this tensor is to just compute this three-point correlator. Thank you, Willie, yeah. So just compute this three-point correlator. J mu, J nu, T rho sigma, and compute it. Well, the simplest place to compute this, sorry, I keep, uh, is, to do, is to do it in free field theory. Uh, maybe I'll just do it over here. So, so if I look at J, J, T, if I want the correlation function, T rho sigma, well, in, in this, at the NF goes to infinity limit, uh, it'll be, well, you'll have one current here, gamma mu, then you have another current here, gamma nu, and then you'll have a t mu nu over here. And, and you have to evaluate this, this graph. Three propagators and lots of indices here. Okay, and you just evaluate that. All right, that's easy to write, uh, but after several weeks of work and many pages of Mathematica, uh, I'm done, you evaluate that one loop graph, that's it. That's all I'm doing evaluating a one-loop graph of free fermions, uh, you get an answer which I won't even write down because there's 176 terms in it. It's a very complicated, huge mess. All right. So that's, uh, and so that's the general form. I mean, at least that's an example of the kind of answer you would get uh, and, a structure, and, a, an and a description of the structure in this very complicated four-index tensor, all of which is in principle strongly constrained by conformal invariance. Okay. All right, so now let's do this with ADS CFT. Suppose I take the Einstein Maxwell action uh, and I go back, you know, this is just, I have Einstein and Maxwell and then I have this rule, 
when I apply this rule, uh, and this rule really relates to not just two-point correlators, but to any number of correlators. So apply this rule uh, and go ahead and compute the three-point the three correlator. All right. Uh, that, unless you're an expert, I don't ask, advise you to do. That's what Suvrat is an expert at. Uh, you, you want to use all these helicity decompositions to make your life simple. Uh, but eventually you can do it. And we did it with his help. Uh, and what you find at the end of the day, when you do that, that, oh, oh, it doesn't agree. It doesn't agree with these 176 terms are not exactly the same. Okay, so what's going on? Well, at this point, you go back and look at, uh, well, actually, we knew this. There was a, there's a paper by Osborne and Petku in, a long time ago in 1993 where they analyzed the general structure of this three-point correlator of a CFT using the rules of conformal invariance. And, and what they said was this three-point correlator was determined by uh, the analog of the central charge and this analog and this curly K, which is a Newton constant, and one additional constant, which could be different for different CFTs. Okay, so that in the ADS CFT context, what this means is that you have, you have another free parameter. You, there's another term that you're allowed to add. Okay, so the simplest term, it turns out, uh, that, that you need to add, which correctly reproduces this three-point correlation function, uh, is a so-called while term. So this is a four-derivative term, where this is a, a two-derivative tensor that you make out of the metric tensor. It's a tensor, it, it has a unique property that it vanishes on, on anti de Sitter space. Uh, and so it's C, and then, and then one gradient of the gauge field here, another gradient of the gauge field here. So uh, there's a number of other terms, four derivative terms you can add, but you can, you can show through some general arguments, and this is really due to Rob Myers, uh, that they won't affect this, this particular three-point correlator. So it turns out also quite magically then, through some arguments on the structure of uh, uh, gravitational actions and their reparameterization invariant, you find that there's only one free parameter left over. So you put the number gamma in, and now you redo the computation. And then you find with this one free parameter, yes indeed, all of those 175 terms completely agree with each other, provided you fix gamma to be some number. So what this tells us is that every CFT has another, another number that we need to know about it. We need to know K, we need to know the central charge, but there's yet another number gamma, which is needed at least to get the three-point correlation function come out right. Yeah. numbers that come in or not? They probably will, in fact, yeah, because they are even more higher derivative terms. Except in CFT2s, you know, where things are well determined, here, yeah, it seems like there's really an infinite number of numbers and we're just stopping at the first four derivative level. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so at this point, this is, you know, we're hoping that this kind of truncation is a good truncation. We don't really know, uh, but anyway, <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, no, this is, there are series of criteria. Uh, the criteria are to keep all possible four derivative terms. So right now, the, at the quadratic level, we had every two derivative terms. We looked at all possible four derivative terms, and from that, you can argue that this is the only one that will affect this particular correlation part. It also turns out to be the only one that affects the conductivity, uh, which, is, uh, which is also good, because we are interested in the conductivity. I don't particularly care for this particular three-point correlator. It turned out to be a very useful diagnostic for figuring out the simplest non-trivial correction to the conductivity. Okay. <laughs> All right. So what I've shown you here is that there's at least a prescription uh, that if you know some data for a CFT, in fact, you know, the, like the scaling dimensions and the operator product expansion coefficients, in principle, there's an effective, uh, there's a classical gravity action which you can expand to any order, which will completely reproduce at tree level all the correlation functions of the CFT. Uh, and that's, you know, that's really the way to think about ADS CFT at this point. It's just a convenient way. Uh, and, and really, in, if, as you've seen here, this particular computation was really much, much harder than the computation that led uh, Rob Myers to just say, this is the important term. That just requires a simple uh, analysis, at least of people in gravity, uh, figuring out what the right term is. 
uh, just a few lines rather than really worrying about the full structure of the conformal transformations of this, this operator. Anyway, so, so in principle then, we can de determine all these numbers. Uh, so what we've tried to do is to take uh, you know, the 1 over NF expansion uh, for your CFT that's here, and rather than using the 1 over NF, NF expansion to compute the conductivity, we just learned that that failed. They're going to use the 1 over NF expansion to compute these coupling constants. Yeah. Uh, well, no. So then there, there's an there additional, there are terms which have uh, two powers of, this, of R. So there's some general terms there. So those would be needed to get the three point correlation of T mu here. Correct. So the, it turns out that for the conductivity, and ultimately we're interested in the conductivity and the effect of the stress energy tensor on the conductivity, uh, things are life a little simple. Once you get to three point of T, it becomes really messy. There's several four, four derivative terms involving R, and uh, those are needed to reproduce the three point correlation function of the stress energy tensor. Yeah. Uh, this is in, in four dimensions. Um, you, I, yes, you do. I think there was a paper by Maldasena and Hoffman where they looked at some aspects of that in, in four going down to five, five going down to four. And this is a lower dimensional version of that. Anyway, oh, there's another very interesting thing you find from this analysis, which I mentioned here, uh, is you find that this, this gravitational action makes sense uh, as a consistent theory of gravity only when gamma is bounded, when it's less than 1 12. That's actually a good thing. You know, this is some higher order term, and we're finding that actually it can't be too big. If it could be 100, then we'd be in trouble. Uh, so perhaps this gamma, this is some hint that this is a good, good way to proceed. Uh, and the amazing thing is that if you take the three-point correlation function here, uh, uh, which then just work completely at the CFT level, then there was a proof by Maldasena and Hoffman that again, uh, this, the analogous parameter in the three-point correlator is bounded by 112. So you get exactly the same bound, either thinking pure CFT without holography or just using classical gravity in holography. Anyway, okay, so, so the philosophy here is we're going to use the 1 over NF expansion to fix all the coupling constants in some effective gravity theory. Uh, that's a well-defined thing. And then we're going to use this gravity theory and turn on our temperature. And we're hoping that in the gravity theory, turning on our temperature is going to be a simpler thing and it will be a regular thing which will not give you all these singularities we found in the mono NF expansion. Okay, so that's sort of, so what happens when you turn on temperature? Well, as you all know, uh, you get a horizon uh, and the, uh, the, the, the position of the horizon is related to the temperature in ADS4 in this way. Uh, and uh, yes, okay, so that has a finite entropy density, and that entropy density is related to the entropy density of your CFT, is in fact equal to it. Uh, and, and finally, the, you find you'll get frictional dissipative properties uh, of your CFT at finite temperature, and these are related to, in, at, in the classical gravity level, to the damping of various modes uh, as they go past the horizon. All right, well, this stuff you know. So anyway, so now you can now again apply these rules to get the conductivity at finite temperature. The rules are the same relating correlation functions in the bulk to the boundary, uh, but now the metric is more complicated, and this is the kind of equation, in, if you want to get the frequency dependent on the conductivity, this is the differential equation that you, uh, at the end of the day, have to solve. All right, so we went ahead and did that, and here are the results. So this is now the finite frequency, finite temperature conductivity, of a CFT in two plus one dimensions. So if you put gamma equals zero, uh, you get an answer which is at, f at first sight very boring, but then at second sight extremely interesting. Uh, you get an answer that's just constant, <laughs> independent of frequency and temperature. And you would say, well, wait a minute, I got, that's the answer, sigma of omega equals constant, uh, that I got just by evaluating this graph. That's a free field answer. So what's the big deal? This is so boring. No, the reason this is important 
you know, this is the answer at finite temperature. If, if I took the free field theory, as I just discussed at the beginning of my lecture, uh, the answer at finite temperature doesn't, is not constant. Uh, it was this silly thing, it was this, yeah, sorry. It, was, it had a delta function. <laughs> uh, so there's no delta function, it's just constant. This, this horrible function is replaced by a constant, a smooth, regular function. So in some sense, it's the exact opposite of free field theory. This is a very strongly turning theory. It has no particles at all, and therefore no delta function, even at this very trivial level. And, and the result is sigma of omega is just a constant. OK, now I'm going to have to go all the way back. <laughs> uh, right, so just a constant. But that's kind of boring. Uh, well, maybe it's a bit. Uh, all right, so, so is this really true? So this is why I really originally we were motivated to look at higher order corrections. Uh, if, in a strongly type of CFT, it's just constant, but what are the first corrections due to gamma? So I've given you all the rules. You go ahead and compute this. Uh, uh, well, I guess there it is. And this is what you get. So what you find uh, is that the, at the maximum possible value of gamma, uh, the conductivity is this red line, has a little dip and then a bump. Uh, and, and this value is 1 plus 4 gamma. It's like a one-third correction. Um, and, and at the minimum possible value of gamma, it has a dip and goes down here. Uh, so just very narrow variation in the frequency dependence of the conductivity, very different from the Boltzmann theory, you know, which had thing going down and then going very sharply up uh, in the limit where it was valid. Here, at the classical gravity level, uh, and including all possible four derivative terms, it's somewhere in between, and this is determined by this one parameter, gamma, which is related to the three-point uh, correlator between j, j, and t. So you can try to give some sort of interpretation of this. Uh, so this looks sort of, at least has the, the, right, the same dips and the peaks as the Boltzmann result. Uh, and this suggests that, okay, this is a theory without particles, but perhaps it has something like a part, some approximate particle -like character anyway. Uh, and the other one, the dip is also you could understand by, if you know a little bit about particle vortex duality. You know, vort so any kind of superfluid uh, will have a vortex representation too. And vortices are one, uh, are, are particles which when you uh, apply a voltage, uh, you know, move uh, in the opposite direction and create a current. So roughly speaking, the conductivity of con uh, vortices is related to the uh, resistivity of particles. So, so what this suggests, this is roughly the inverse of the other curve, uh, that it, when gamma is less than zero, you're talking about a theory of vortices rather than a theory of particles. Uh, so that's the best physical interpretation one can give to these rather complicated, strongly interacting results. Uh, right. And uh, the ABGM model at n equals infinity is, in fact, has gamma equals zero. Uh, yeah, um, we don't know what happens at order one over n, one over nc, but nc equals infinity is, is, is that value. In fact, we even know the value of sigma of infinity precisely for that theory. Okay, what else am I going to say? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that's where the, this picture, that was the role of this picture. So thank you for reminding me. Uh, here, because you're at particle hole symmetry at zero density, uh, you can have a finite current flow where the net momentum is zero. Uh, you have particles moving this way and holes moving this way, equal and opposite. So a hole moving this way corresponds to a current moving this way. Particle moving this way correspond to current moving this way. So this, so this flow of particles and holes has zero momentum but finite current. So, so what this means is that if you set up this flow, the question you have to ask, can the flow go down to zero? Well, certainly this particle collide with this particle, and you can conserve momentum and both come to rest. Uh, so you can certainly dissipate the momentum away, because it's zero anyway, uh, and therefore you can dissipate the current to zero. So if you set up a current in this system in the CFT, it will decay to zero at long times. Uh, and that's why the conductivity is finite. Okay. This is very much related to what Sean was talking about earlier. He was always, so there's a, there was a chi pj in Sean's discussion. Chi pj is zero. 
uh, in, for CFTs. Simply because one has a, this, the current J, uh, well, uh, well, there's a charge conjugation symmetry under which they have opposite signatures, basically. <laughs> Well, I'm coming to that. Of course, certainly things will change. Even a small amount of chemical potential will completely change everything. That's sort of what Sean was trying to describe, and I'll also turn to that shortly. Huh? No, no, you're correct. It, it, strong, any chemical potential will completely, at least at low frequencies, change this picture. And, and, I, and that's the next topic that I'm going to come to. Any other questions? Yeah. Well, if I consider the next law charge, my best bet is this photo concept. What I know is that this photo concept was a zero in interacting space. You're talking about flat space, QED. Yeah. No, but that's not a property here. This is an anti decitus space. It's, it remains a, it's a pure number. <coughs> it doesn't renormalize, no. Well, in any case, I'm only doing classical gravity. <laughs> But even if you include quantum gravity, if you could do the full ground quantum gravity theory, we believe it will it'll go to a fixed point. It doesn't, you know, that's because you're in curved space. Yeah. And you mentioned that in the CFT time you use a one over an F uh, computation to just remind me of the gamma. Yes, it. yes. So what if I really do to the one over NC computation? Well, I don't know how to do the one over NC computation except by doing holography. You know, that's... Uh, I think, well, but the most spirit of your answer, I think, for example, Sung Sik Lee is developing these methods for taking actual field theories and doing a one over NC matrix representation and deriving gravity from it. So perhaps his methods will eventually allow us to compute these numbers using, uh, using one over NC expansion, possibly. But we don't have, right now we just, what I'm doing is the following. I take a CFT, I compute its conformal data in the one over NF expansion. And then I say, the CFT, let me imagine it has some holographic representation. I don't know what it is, but let's imagine what it is. And I just write down the most general one, and then I match two-point and three-point correlation functions to make sure they all match. Okay, having done that, I've got a theory that at least I've determined I'm going to raise temperature. And then I have some predictions. So that's sort of where we are at. <laughs> uh, and so now I'm going to take these predictions and test them in the worst possible case uh, with just one boson, uh, you know, and uh, if, well, basically a theory which you can write as a gauge theory, which is U1 gauge theory with one scalar. So that's the worst possible case, not large NF, not large NC, and, and let's see what it, what it, how well it does. <laughs> Things can only get better from there. <laughs> uh, all right, so... All right, so, so let me, yeah, I'm going to jump ahead then. All right, so, so this is work with uh, Eric Sorensen and William Wichak Krempa. Uh, and and Lode Pollet and his group, uh, he tells me, have somewhat related results, but I'll just show you our results. This is still in progress, but uh, uh, I'll show you the results. So what, uh, what Eric in particular had been doing for a while and uh, did uh, at uh, William's suggestion started doing again in more detail was take was investigate the very simplest possible quantum critical point and that's the Wilson Fisher fixed point of a complex scalar I, that was my, what I mentioned at the very beginning of my of my lectures uh, the superfluid insulated transition of bosons in a periodic potential so so there's a, there's many different very fancy tricks uh, by which you can simulate this critical point uh, there's a way you can just write it in terms of integer loops and they just simulate these loops on a three-dimensional cubic lattice. Uh, or you can also use a quantum representation where you write it in terms of what's called a Villain model, and which you can also uh, then simulate very rapidly uh, using uh, cluster algorithms. So you would say if you can simulate this, you know, what's the difficulty? Well, of course, all of these simulations are in imaginary time. That's, that's, that's the difficulty. So you do this very work really hard, and uh, yeah, I'm glad I got these questions. Uh, and out of, the, out of the simulation, you're going to get the value of sigma at these points. Oh, sorry, now it's, uh, 
what did I say? Right, so this omega is actually bosonic. It's the fermions inside the loop that were, that were fermionic. Uh, so for sigma, anyway, these would be even, even, even frequencies, uh, two pi t's multiples. So you know them all along at a discrete set of points in the imaginary frequency axis. And from that information, um, I want to get the, the real frequency axis. Actually, I, even for the case I was discussing, this was wrong. I should have had, somebody should have stopped me. It's with two pi t, four pi t, let me correct it. <laughs> Well, for the current correlation function, uh, there's, there's a point here, and there's 2 pi t, 4 pi t, and so on. So out from this simulation comes values of the current uh, at these points. Okay. Um, of course, this is now in a system with a lattice cutoff, and we are interested in very low frequencies and temperatures much smaller than any lattice energy scale. So, yeah, okay, that I've already said. And, and the difficulty is precisely how you go from, from these points on the imaginary frequency axis uh, to points on the real frequency axis. You have to go from knowing this to, cons to, to reconstruct this. And, and this is kind of what's in the class of what are called ill-posed problems, that if you make even an exponentially small correction here, uh, you'll get an exponentially large correction here. Uh, so unless you have some additional information, in principle, and, or you have extremely precise data, uh, this is really not something you want to try. <laughs> uh, all right, so this, anyway, so this is the, uh, the result that uh, Eric got for the value of sigma of omega. This is actually involves many different extrapolations to low temperatures and infinite system size, uh, and we looked at more than one system, and when you're, uh, when you're done with it, this is the kind of data you get. This is omega, this is, I think, uh, I think it's omega over 2 pi t, that's the axis, and this is the value of the conductivity on the imaginary frequency axis. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to say, well, I have a theory here. Uh, the theory can also work on the imaginary frequency axis. So let me just take my theory, uh, that this holographic theory of divine, and compare it to, to this result on the imaginary axis. So why should I bother taking this data and doing the analytic continuation? because uh, I don't really know how to do that well. Uh, so let me just take the theory and fit it. Uh, and you find a really quite reasonable fit for a value of around gamma, which is smaller than 1 12, thankfully. If it was bigger than 1 12, then we'd be worried. You know, it could have been 10, but no. It's, a, it's right in the range that you expect for a strongly coupled uh, uh, theory. Remember, for the Boltzmann theory, this is a huge singular function. It wouldn't make uh, any sense at all. Uh, but the actual simulation for the O2 critical point uh, at least is strongly coupled in the sense that the effective value of gamma that you get uh, is, uh, is small. So from this, uh, so once we know gamma, we're, 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 we're all set. We can just take this data uh, and compute the conductivity uh, as a function of uh, real, uh, in the whole complex plane. So for example, we fit, the, so this is the complex frequency plane, the same plane here. Uh, so we fit the data over there, but now we have a theory which is completely consistent with all possible sum rules, all possible uh, water entities of conformal invariance, causality, the second law of thermodynamics, all of those are automatically built into uh, our procedure. And they're respected therefore by the analytic, our, our way of converting this to that. <laughs> um, also, one other property of this function sigma, which I uh, didn't discuss, was that it's an analytic function on the complex frequency plane. But what you can prove, furthermore, uh, is that it has poles only in the lower half plane. Well, that you knew, uh, because it couldn't be anything on the upper half plane. But also, you can show that it has zeros. All its zeros are on the lower half plane. Uh, that, again, something the holographic theory tells you. Uh, and finally, and there was one more constraint that I, yeah, which I skipped over. Uh, there are certain sum rules. So this function sigma of omega on the, this axis has to obey these sum rules. And these are exact sum rules for the conformal field theory that you can, again, prove by holographic methods. Uh, and the amazing thing is that the holographic theory is actually the first theory that satisfied both sum rules. The Boltzmann theory satisfied this sum rule, but it, it disobeys this sum rule. 
so there's some exact result, properties of the actual conductivity of CFT that the conventional one of NF expansion would just violate because it doesn't know about uh, this second sum rule. Anyway, so all of these sum rules, the causality constraints, the poles and zeros, everything is built into our procedure for going from imaginary time to real time. So, sorry to interrupt. So yeah. the green curve was obtained by sort of just, uh, the, this is the ADS CFT result sort of in a way continued to imaginary. No, no, this is all in, yeah, yeah. Well, the ADS, you can, yeah. it's, it's even and more and trivial and to do ADS CFT in imaginary time. We just solve the equation in imaginary time. Uh, yeah. Well, so uh, yeah. Well, oh, so I should say uh, there's one one fly in the ointment that I haven't uh, mentioned so far. So all of this works very beautifully, and I'm all ready to celebrate. But one thing doesn't quite work is that this particular axis has been rescaled by a factor of around four to make this fit work. Uh, and at least in the formulation we have, there's no, you know, this particular axis is just integers. It's omega over 2 pi t. I don't think you're allowed to rescale it. So we don't understand that. Now, maybe there's, a, maybe there's some, so maybe there is some quantum gravity correction we do have to worry about. But this, it would almost be too much if everything worked perfectly. <laughs> but that's one thing that doesn't work. And we're still thinking about why that doesn't work that well. Uh, anyway, so what we can do then, so our procedure is, okay, let's, not worry so much about that axis rescaling. Uh, let's say we have a value of gamma. Then from the value of gamma, what happened? Oh, it's my computer. Oh, it's running out of power. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so from the value of gamma, we can take that green line and get the full complex plane. And you know, you get, uh, you get these poles in the lower half plane, and uh, you plot one over sigma, you'll see where the zeros are, and you'll satisfy all the sum rules correctly. And so the prediction for the physical conductivity that in principle maybe someday Emmanuel's block will measure in his experiment uh, will be this, this curve here, okay? So we have now a you know, full prediction then of the frequency to the conductivity uh, where this value at infinity is determined by matching to the CFT, but the whole curve uh, is then determined from our knowledge of gamma that we got from the, from the simulations. So, you know, this is a, well, let's see if this works. So, so this is, you know, this is then an experimental prediction. So let's see, you stuck our heads out. <laughs> We're going to make an experimental prediction of a quantity that's coming out of ADS CFT uh, with nothing free left over. But, you know, even if it works within, a, I would have been happy if it worked even with a factor of two or three, because this is, as I said, the worst case. Uh, and the hope is that now these methods of AD, there's the same philosophy that you could now use ADS CFT methods to address many other very difficult questions of strongly interacting systems, like the ones that the other speakers have spoken about, like non-equilibrium dynamics, non-linear transport, uh, quench dynamics, and so on. Uh, those can all be readily applied to, to these kind of actions, and in principle, we know all the parameters in the action too, at least for these simple O2 CFT. Uh, Right, this is just, I guess, a slide prepared by William showing that there's an earlier paper by Eric Sorensen about eight years ago where he tried to do the analytic, had roughly similar data and did the analytic continuation by some per day method. Uh, and, you know, see that curve looks very, very different from what you get by, by the modern analysis. Uh, anyway, so let me then conclude that, let me just summarize what the message I've tried to get across for finite temperature studies of CFTs. Uh, so let me contrast it with what you do in traditional condensed matter physics. Uh, when you're dealing with the Fermi liquid, for example, you identify quasi-particles with dispersion. You compute their scattering matrix elements. You put everything in the Boltzmann equation, and then you predict everything uh, in sight. Uh, so in, in the new world, uh, you're going to start with an interacting CFT without quasi-particles. So step one fails. 
But there's an analogous procedure. Instead of computing the scattering matrix element, you compute the OPE coefficients. You take all this data and put this into a gravitational theory in ADS. So the Einstein-Maxwell theory replaces the Boltzmann equation. And out you get predictions for, for the same set of results. So that's kind of the, the new route that uh, hopefully will give us some insight into strongly interacting systems at finite temperature. OK, so that concludes conformal field theories and finite temperature. Any further questions? Yeah. That's an interesting idea. They haven't done that. We haven't done that yet, but we can think about that. Yeah, no, that, yeah, this is, you know, already several months of computer work by some of the world's experts. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think that's something to keep in mind. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? I mean, what would be also nice if you could put a gauge field. Uh, this theory actually secretly is a gauge theory. Uh, which is another reason I'm, I like it. Um, you know, the, you may not know that uh, the Wilson-Fisher fixed point, the O2 Wilson-Fisher fixed point is exactly dual. Uh, maybe I'll just mention that. So there's a, there's a result which I think you have to credit Das Gupta and Halperin that goes back to, is that right? Yeah. Uh, that goes back to the mid-70s which is a baby version of what's called mirror symmetry in string theory these days, uh, or two plus one dimension CFTs. Uh, there's an exact, but this here there's no, there's no supersymmetry. So the theory I'm dealing with here uh, is the following theory, this O2 CFT that we have been studying. Uh, yeah, here, wherever, uh, is the following theory. It's d mu psi squared plus r psi squared plus u psi to the fourth. And, and as you all know, as a function of r, this has two phases, uh, which is psi not equal to 0 here, psi equal to 0. Uh, and this is the CFT. OK. No gauge fields. However, this theory is believed, and there's a lot of strong arguments, it's exactly dual to the following theory. So I'll write as d mu minus i a mu. Um, let me call it phi squared plus r tilde phi squared plus u phi to the fourth, plus u tilde phi to the fourth, uh, where this is a fluctuating gauge field. So this is what you might call the abelian Higgs model. This is just, the, uh, well, just a five-fourth field theory. Uh, and it turns out this theory and this theory are, in fact, exactly the same. But this direction is now r tilde. And this phase, so you think of this as a kind of vortex field. So in the insulator, the vortex is condensed. It's exactly the opposite. Here, uh, the vortex is gapped in the superfluid. Um, and it's a remarkable result that this theory is exactly the same as that theory at the CFT. So we can also think of this uh, as a, C, um, well, abelian Higgs CFT. And these are the same CFT, remarkably. So for example, you might think this is nuts. Uh, if, you, if, you're so you, if you're used to CFT twos, you know, you count degrees of freedom. What is the central charge? You would say the central charge is two bosons, so it's kind of like two. Uh, here the central charge is two bosons and one gauge field. So the one gauge field is like one scalar, so it's three. So how can uh, a theory with three degrees of freedom be the same as two degrees of freedom? Well, they are the same. And, and the whole point is that kind of counting of free particles, which works so well in two dimensions, completely fails in three dimensions. Uh, these are the same theory with the same central charge. We don't really know what it is, but you can get it by numerical studies, perhaps. Uh, in particular, they would have the same conductivity when properly defined the same gamma, and so on. Uh, and this was first pointed out by uh, Das Gupta and Halpern and also Peskin, although not as clearly as they did. Uh, and it was really the start of all these duality arguments by Mendelstam 
uh, and a tuft which led to these dual models of instantons and confinement and gauge theory. There's like a baby version of all of that. But this is an exact statement about two CFTs in two, two plus one dimensions with no supersymmetry. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, it is the same thing. Well, uh, so it's a particle vortex duality. Is one theory quantum and one theory quantum? No, they're both quantum. Um, they're both fully quantum. Yeah, that's exactly what happens here. So this, well, here the gauge field is gone. It's kind of a trivial limit. Uh, but here, uh, yeah, so the, the Higgs branch here is this one. Well, so the Coulomb branch here is this side, right? And the Higgs, that's also the Higgs side. So the Coulomb branch of phi is the Higgs branch of psi. That's correct. So there's a supersymmetric analog of this by Kapustin and, uh, uh, not Kapustin and who used Strassler. So they have n equals one supersymmetric QED. Uh, they have a whole set of, uh, with many flavors. They're analogs of this for higher number of flavors. But the self-duality, you no, know, it's n equals two SQED with one flavor uh, has exactly the same mapping. Then there, this thing just becomes free fields where n equals two uh, matter. Uh, and this is a S supersymmetric QED. And there's a duality between them. That was first proved by Kapustin and Strassler. And that's a supersymmetric analog. This is not proven, but it's almost certainly true. When you have a supersymmetry, how do you show, uh, you compute the anomalous dimension? We don't know the anomalous dimension exactly. I'd love to tell you more about how this is proven. It's, it's usually the best proofs I've seen. Well, you, re, you do a lattice regularization, and you do these Villan transformations, and then you can see it from there. So you, you see it approximately at the lattice level, and then you conjecture it's true exactly. Uh, in the continuum. Okay, I'm getting a bit sidetracked. <laughs> anyway, so what we've studied here is this theory, effectively. Uh, so it's, it's a gauge theory. Uh, and it'd be nice to study, this is by how I got started on this track, other gauge theories by, by numerical studies, I will say. <laughs> yeah. And what question could you also tackle it? So during this model, if you're discussing it, would the gamma come in? <laughs> Uh, well, the gamma would involve other higher derivative terms with, with two powers of the stress energy tensor of the gravity of the curvature tensor. Uh, I, yeah, we haven't thought about that. Uh, we are still thinking of just computing the two-point correlation function of the stress energy tensor to get the central charge. That already is hard enough. Viscosity would be another another, another level of difficulty. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right, so now um, I, I want to change gears and uh, add a chemical potential. So this will refer back to many of the things that uh, uh, John McGreevy, for instance, talked about, and I think Sean will say more about. Uh, so we're going to go to this last, last example here of compressible quantum matter. Uh, and there's a lot to say here. I'm not sure exactly what I'm going to cover, but I'm, I think today's lecture, I'm pretty sure what I'm going to say. <laughs> But tomorrow, depending upon uh, how things go and what your questions are, um, I can I can go go ahead. So anyway, what so what is compressible? Let me just discuss some general things. Uh, so what is compressible quantum matter? Uh, so here's a very general definition. Uh, let's, for simplicity, imagine we are in the continuum. You could put a lattice if you want, but let's for now imagine you're in the continuum. And you take any quantum field theory you want. All I ask that it be uh, translationally invariant, and there'll be a U1 charge, conserved U1 charge, and I'll call the charge density Q. So typically in condensed matter, that'll be the electron density, but it could be the spin density, it could be anything you want, uh, some conserved quantity. Okay, so what is uh, a compressible state? A compressible state is one in which I can take my Hamiltonian and add another term, H minus mu Q, uh, and as I, and I just look at the ground state, and I ask how the ground state changes as I tune mu. So my Hamiltonian changes, I tune mu, uh, and, what, and a compressible state is one in which dq d mu is not equal to zero. In other words, I can just make q anything I want just by tuning mu. That's compressibility, okay? That's my definition. Some infinite system, 
uh, do this change and Q changes. Okay, easy enough. Um, so then I ask you, list, list me some compressible system. And the list is very short. So I'm going to give you the complete list. <laughs> well, first of all, there's a one very big member of the list, uh, whoops, uh, yeah, which is CFT is in one dimension, one plus one dimension. So if I take a CFT2, uh, all CFT2s are compressible. So that's a huge sector of compressible systems, but I'm not terribly interested in them uh, because changing the density of a CFT2 doesn't change very much. And roughly speaking, it's the following reason. Uh, in in two, one plus one dimensions, say you have some left movers and right movers, and this is your chemical potential. So you have some Fermi velocity here, and Fermi velocity here. These are the occupied states, say, of some Fermi system. Uh, then I change the chemical potential, so I move it over here, and then I get, well, what, what does that do? That changes the charge density, and I get more particles in here. Uh, but now my excitations are here and here, and those are still a CFT. Nothing much has changed, I just move the point at which uh, I am defining my CFT. So compressible system in one plus one dimension, that kind of a special case. They're still CFTs, even if you put a chemical potential on, eventually it becomes a new CFT, or almost the same CFT, but at a different KF. Right. So we're not so interested in, in fact, I'm not interested in one dimension. Uh, so I want to talk about compressible systems in dimension D uh, greater than one. And in D greater than one, basically all compressible systems will not be conformal field theories. So why am I applying the ADSC correspondence to them, ADSC FT correspondence? Well, I'm going to take compressible systems that are near conformal field theories, just because that's one way to study them. <laughs> uh, another point which you can, which is a simple, simple homework exercise to prove, any compressible system must, have, must be gapless. Uh, and the reason is really very simple. Uh, because Q is a conserved charge, Q and H commute with each other. So if I change mu, uh, that actually doesn't change the eigenvectors or eigen, eigenvectors of H, just changes the eigenvalues a little bit. Well, if there's a gap between the ground state and the first excited state, and I change both a little bit, the ground state doesn't change. It's still the same state. So the expectation value of Q in the ground state doesn't change. So I've got to have a system with lots of states just above the ground state, so that when I change mu, the ground state becomes an excited state and some other state comes below. And that will happen only if there's no gap. Okay, so there has to be a whole continuum of states. Uh, CFTs are such systems, uh, but uh, um, a gap system like a quantum Hall state is not compressible. Okay, so what are some examples of compressible systems? Uh, one is a crystal. So you could just take your particles, uh, add them, in, and then uh, make a regular arrangement of them. Uh, sometimes called a Wigner crystal. And this is obviously compressible because when you change the chemical potential, they just squeeze the crystal a little bit, you put a few more particles at the edge, and the density changes continuously, just by changing the... But the trouble with this state, of course, is that it breaks translational symmetry. And, and let's say we don't want to break any symmetry. Okay. Okay, uh, yes? The Wigner crystal is really set up with the one over R. I mean, we'll oh, okay. okay so. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, there are some caveats of that type. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm coming. To, you certainly have to have break. Uh, you have to break translate. You, so one way to get a compressible system is to break a continuous symmetry, exactly. But I'm interested in compressible systems that don't break any symmetry. That's where I'm going. How do I get, so you know, we have learned to, so we have to get a gapless system. And what we have learned in field theory is the way you get gapless system is by breaking a symmetry and getting Goldstone modes. Uh, so here there are Goldstone modes, which is the phonons, and that's why you can add more particles, uh, just by squeezing, just squeezing the system. Uh, the other way you can break a symmetry is to actually break the U1 symmetry, and that's for superfluid. Okay, so now when you add more particles, they can just go into the condensate, no problem. Um, and you've broken a symmetry, fine. 
It's a gapless system. You have Goldstone modes. You have a condensate. Uh, it's compressible, right? So how do you get a so you know so what we need is a system which has gapless excitations without any broken symmetry, and those gapless excitations have to be protected. They have to, can't be fine tuned. They have to be always there. Okay. So now you can see from a field theory perspective, getting a compressible system without a broken symmetry is actually a very strange thing, it's, at least. But from a condensed matter perspective, it's what you learn about the very first day, uh, because uh, that's the Fermi liquid. <laughs> uh, so Fermi liquid is a state. It's a ground state of quantum field theory that doesn't break any uh, symmetry. But nevertheless, uh, and it can live in any dimension, but nevertheless has gapless excitations, which are protected. There's just actually no way to get rid of them uh, because of something called the Leidenger theorem. Um, Right, so I'll review some of these basic highlights of the Fermi liquid as I go along. Uh, so that's the, and in fact, that's the, really the only other example that's been thoroughly understood and experimentally tested. It's the Fermi liquid. <laughs> so that's, you know, I sent to something like this. Fermi liquid is a piece of 21st century physics that somehow landed in the 20th century, at least if you're a field theorist. <laughs> but if you're a condensed matter theorist, it seems kind of, no, you don't even question it. It seems so obvious. <laughs> All right, so now as uh, Tadashi mentioned, uh, so what, what I want to get to eventually, so what we'll see is that even though in field theory, it's so hard to get compressible states, in holography, it's trivial. They're just everywhere. So now you have to decide, you know, are there lots of other compressible states that we don't know about, or is holography just completely wrong? Uh, we're hoping the answer is somewhere in between that, at least I think, that there are many other compressible states that we're just only starting to learn, and holography is giving, at the moment, giving too many examples. We need to know how to correct holography to get the right set of physical examples. Okay, so that's, it's towards that aim that I'm going, the rest of my lectures will be about to kind of give you a flavor of what's wrong with holography and what do we know from condensed matter, what are the other examples of compressible states you might find, and how are you going to fix this by going beyond just simple Einstein-Maxwell theories? So one very important tool, at least so far in some of our work, uh, has been the entanglement entropy. Uh, and Tadashi mentioned in his lecture, this Fermi liquid state is also special and unusual in one other way. Uh, that is, if you, in, in dimensions greater than one, spatial dimensions, Almost all quantum systems that we study obey what's called the area law of entanglement entropy. You take a region, you compute the entanglement entropy. Uh, the entanglement entropy goes as the surface area of the region. Okay. Uh, but as Tadashi explained, in a Fermi liquid, that's violated. The entanglement entropy goes as A log A, where A is the area of the surface. So there's a logarithmic uh, violation as a product of the area law of entanglement entropy in the Fermi liquid. So, one of the, so at this point, I'd like to make a conjecture, which is based upon uh, everything I've learned and, uh, from, from other exotic compressible states in condensed matter physics, uh, and which I believe is true for all uh, compressible states, that, okay, now we're going to work very hard to find other compressible quantum states, read strange metal, and that's what a strange metal is, it's a compressible quantum state, uh, and we don't want it to break any symmetry, so my conjecture is that all compressible quantum states which don't break the U1 symmetry also still have this feature, that they're going to have log violation of entanglement entropy. And uh, I'll try to give you a sense of where that comes from. Certainly every example, more exotic example we know in condensed matter has this feature. Um, okay. But many of the examples in holography don't. So that suggests that those examples either are just not worth looking at further, or really, or maybe they're still worth looking at, but they require some further corrections that we need to worry about, if this conjecture is correct. Okay? <laughs> so I'm hoping by the end of my lectures now on Friday, uh, you'll have a sense of where this came from. So the logarithmic violation is a multiplicative law. Yeah, it's a multiplicative law. Uh, additive, well, uh, Additive logs are subdominant to the area law anyway. So it's A log A. Yeah, correct. They appear sort of for the U1 broken symmetry. That's right, yeah. Yeah, but it's not A, it's just log A, it's not A log A. Gotcha. 
<laughs> so this is the leading term, not the, the divergent term is the one that gets violated. That's very unusual. I, even cold stone modes don't do that. Yeah. All right, so uh, this is one tentative outline. I'd at least talk about part A and perhaps part B, since many others talked about it before. And then we'll see what I talk about next time. All right, so let's go back to my favorite example of graphene. So this is my graphene phase diagram with the CFT. So what's the philosophy here? Well, since we're doing ADS CFT, the philosophy is we want to start, we want to understand compressible states that are non Fermi liquids, that are not Fermi liquids with strong interactions. So let's start from a state that already has strong interactions built in. And our favorite state with strong interaction is the CFT. So we start with the CFT and add a chemical potential. See what kind of compressible states we get. So for graphene, we can do that, at least for real graphene this way. And the answer is kind of boring. It's basically from the liquids. Uh, so we want to, for example, take the CFT and add another axis, which is chemical potential. Uh, so if I was sitting here, we have a Dirac semi-metal, and the answer is simply very clear. Uh, I get a, if you had a chemical, positive chemical potential, I get a Fermi surface of electrons. And if I had a negative chemical potential, I get a whole Fermi surface. And that's compressible to all orders and interactions. Uh, and if I look at the full phase diagram, it's not so crucial that you follow all of this. This is the kind of phase diagram you'll get. This is my tuning axis that I had before. This is my other tuning axis now, chemical potential. Uh, and this was the point we were setting earlier. The graphene examples are here. Uh, there's antiferromagnetism here. Uh, and so you get some antiferromagnetic metals over here. Uh, but it's very fairly clear. I won't go into it. But if you know enough solid state physics, you can kind of see that along this line, in fact, it's again just an ordinary Fermi liquid, just a usual. Uh, metal, it's not a non Fermi liquid, it's the compressible state that we know and love. Uh, so, at least for this particular example, when I add a chemical potential, I don't get anything exotic. But the hope is, and that's what holography teaches us uh, if I add a chemical potential to something that has a holographic description, it seems to give something highly non Fermi liquid like, and we want to figure out you know, what's going on. Okay, I have five minutes left, so what I'm going to do before I stop is actually just review for you some basic properties of a Fermi liquid. <laughs> uh, all right. So here, so here, say I'm sitting uh, right near, uh, near that surface. Uh, then actually, it doesn't matter much that I have the Dirac cone because it's way down on the Fermi surface. So you could even write it in. It doesn't matter, really. You can write it as non-relativistic or relativistic electrons. So this is the theory um, of a Fermi liquid. So let me just remind you of a few. Well, hope maybe if you haven't seen it before, well, here it is, uh, just uh, encouragement to take your solid state physics course to learn all the proofs of these statements. Uh, so I take, say, three fermions and a chemical potential uh, with some interactions, say, short range four Fermi terms. OK, when I have exactly three fermion, then they occupy uh, the, the inside of what's called the Fermi sphere. In this case, it's the Fermi circle, whose radius is kf. And the volume enclosed uh, by the circle is equal to the density of electrons. So that's uh, the statement that's obviously true in free electrons because we're just counting electrons. It's a simple counting argument uh, that, more precisely, in two dimensions, it'll be integral d2k over 4 pi squared, 0 to kf, uh, is equal to q. And these are both densities. This is inverse length. So this is a density. This is a density inverse length squared. So, and uh, there's no fudge factors, no, uh, no factors of h bar or c or anything. It's fully determined. OK. And then the Luttinger's uh, remarkable result is that this relationship has no renormalization under, to all orders in the Fermi interactions. You can put in as much interaction you want. Uh, this is always exactly the same. This, I have an, I'm skipping over a little bit exactly how you define kf in that case. Uh, well, you define KF rough, actually, there was in, I think, Tadashi's lecture, or maybe Joe's lecture, there's a jump in the, in the uh, electron uh, momentum distribution function, for example, that defines KF. All right, so that's one basic property. What are the excitations? Well, the simplest excitations 
are particles and holes uh, that you create near the Fermi surface. And you can see near the Fermi surface, they're just like, they're chiral fermions. They just disperse linearly in energy, just like over there. They just disperse linearly in energy, except the direction can change, of course. So if you wanted to say there's some dynamic exponent z of the fermionic excitation, you would say omega is q to the z, but z is 1. But there's some, some remnant of a relativistic structure, because right near the Fermi surface, you have a linear dispersion. Uh, OK, so from this, you can figure out uh, what is the uh, entropy of a Fermi liquid at finite temperature. So this is the world's most complicated way to, to get this result. <laughs> but it is the correct result. Uh, so what I told you was that uh, uh, roughly speaking, in a Fermi liquid, this is the Fermi, uh, there's a chiral fermion here. So there's like a C equals 1 half chiral fermion. Uh, and we know the specific heat of a C equals 1 half chiral fermion is basically temperature times the central charge, which is 1 half, times some factor of the pi that I don't remember. So you just add up all the chiral fermions you have, and the number of chiral fermions you have is proportional to the area of the Fermi surface, which is 2 pi r, 2 pi kf, um, and that basically gives you the specific heat. So it's just the answer of conformal field theory in 1 plus 1 dimension, but it applies in any dimension because each point on the Fermi surface is like a chiral fermion, 1D chiral fermion, moving in the radial direction. So that's why the entropy density, or the specific heat uh, of a Fermi liquid is temperature. OK, so this was one of the, I guess it was Sommerfeld's result, right? This was the, one of the early results establishing, explaining the specific heat of metals, establishing Fermi statistics, uh, and the, which led to the block theory of uh, band structure, and so on. So, and it was a very important result in the history of quantum mechanics, uh, showing you how the specific heat of a metal vanished at low temperatures, whereas classically it goes to a constant. <laughs> uh, all right, so now if you deal with uh, conformal field theories, uh, and you do the same argument for conformal field theory, say in three dimensions, uh, so the simplest conformal field theory in three dimensions uh, is the free photons. And for them, the entropy density is, goes as t cubed. That's a Stefan Boltzmann law. Uh, and in general, in d dimension, it goes as t to the d. Uh, so uh, there's a scaling argument that uh, I won't go through, that it generally must go as t to the d over z. But so now this is going as t. It's not going as t to the d at all. So if you want to fix it into the scaling picture, uh, you say, well, let me introduce another exponent. So this is a fudge factor, which we call theta. And theta, if theta is d minus 1, uh, then uh, we, this is the world's most complicated way of writing down uh, the entropy density uh, of a Fermi liquid. Now, uh, when I get to this next time, uh, I'll define theta and z in terms of the metric of holography. I'll give you, you, you give me a metric, I'll take the metric and tease out theta and, and z from it. Uh, and then I'll argue using Hawking entropy that the entropy density goes this way. So that's a useful way of thinking about things because that tells us what values of theta and z do I need to, to reproduce the answer for a Fermi liquid. So that's really the reason for writing t in this horribly complicated way. Uh, and finally, and I'll end with this, as with something I've already mentioned, uh, the entanglement entropy of a Fermi liquid violates the area law. So in this case, you're in two dimensions. So this is the perimeter law. So if you have some perimeter p of region A, uh, then for a circular Fermi surface, this is the exact answer. Uh, and in, in, in fact, not renormalized by interactions. Uh, this is exactly the answer, 1 12th KFP, where P is the perimeter of this region. Uh, and this 1 12th is very much related to the C over 3 uh, that Tadashi had for CFT2s, and the fact that C is 1 half for uh, uh, chiral fermion. So it, it's really closely related to the result that Tadashi had, and they turn out to be very universal in the case of a Fermi liquid. Uh, but there's one very curious property here, uh, which was emphasized by Brian Swingle, 
that this result is actually independent of the shape of this region. So if I take another region, uh, this I've already said, take another region with different shape but the same perimeter, its entanglement entropy is still the same. It doesn't change. It only depends on the perimeter, does not depend on the shape. Uh, for a circular Fermi surface, if you had a elliptical Fermi surface, that's not true. Uh, and that's kind of, again, a result that uh, I think is in this paper by Brian. Uh, it's kind of peculiar. And uh, our defining property, I believe, of not just Fermi liquids, but all compressible systems. Uh, and we're going to use this, in fact, as one of the benchmarks for, for any possible holographic representation of a Fermi liquid next time. Okay, so I guess I will have to talk about that. So here's in the summary. Whoops, yeah, I'll just stop here. Right, I'll just stop here. So this is then your one sheet summary of everything you need to know about a Fermi liquid. <laughs> that it obeys the Luttinger relation. It has Z equals one. The entropy is, vanishes linearly with temperature, and the entanglement entropy behaves like this. Uh, and uh, that's all we're going to need. And we're going to now compare these sets of results with holography. Next time. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Has this relation been proven in dimensions greater than two, I guess? Which relation? La the last relation for the entanglement. I mean, you mentioned it for a case when the P is a uh, Yeah. Well, I don't know about proven. There are, it's, there are general strong arguments which work in any dimension. Yes, correct. For, as long as you know Fermi liquid. There's also a paper by Kun Yang, uh, which uses kind of a bosonization method to come up with the same results. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, there are numerical tests also. There's even. Uh, it's true for free, free fermions. Uh, yeah, but the question is is it true for uh, interacting fermions? So there are also I wanted some computer studies of free fermions where it's been, oh, no, interacting fermions where it seems to work well. Uh, there's even predictions by Brian Single of subleading terms. The next correction beyond the power law, and those also work, in fact, uh, with with this theory. So it's it's in pretty good shape. Yeah. Uh, is there any evidence for the test based Well, a conformal field theory. <laughs> a conformal field theory in in two and higher dimensions is gapless, but it's not compressible because the compressibility is zero. Uh, you know, for a conformal field theory, except in one dimension. So the compressibility of a conformal field theory is t to the d minus 1, with d is spatial dimension. Uh, that you can, again, see from just by scaling law. Uh, right. <laughs> Further questions? <laughs>